All right, good morning. Um, this is Steve Klein. This is a case study review for remote sensing of rivers. Um, as you can see from the photograph, this case study centers on a different part of the world than we've been focused on, focusing on in this class. This is actually about two river systems in South Asia, um, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, uh, which both discharge into the Bay of Bengal through Bangladesh. And this is an article published in 2012 um, written by Herpa and others. Uh, the title was Upstream Satellite Remote Sensing for River Discharge Forecasting Application to Major Rivers in South Asia. And it's published in the journal Remote Sensing of the Environment. And um, I'll explain what some of these things in this, this map mean in a little bit. But before I do, I want to talk just briefly about a country that, um, that I have a lot of interest in, which is um, Bangladesh. And some of you may know a little bit about it, but um, Bangladesh is a very new state in the world. It's only been around since 1971. It is the um, it is the result of British colonialism, uh, like a lot of places around the world are. Um, when the British left in the 19 late 1940s, um, when they decided that it was time to leave their massive uh, colony they called British India and let the people there uh, run it for themselves. They decided that the best thing to do was not just to leave and, and, um, and uh, not set anything up on the way out. Instead, they helped the British leaderships, uh, leadership people like Nehru and um, some of the, the Pakistani leaders to draw boundaries. And those boundaries, for the most part, exist still as a result of what they did. Um, Bangladesh did not exist at that time. It was known as East Pakistan, and modern-day Pakistan was known as West Pakistan. And the reason for the division was primarily because the two majority religions in the region were Hindus, which made up um, a, uh, a majority of the population, but um, a large minority was also Muslim. <clears throat> and so Pakistan, East and West Pakistan, were the majority Muslim regions, that were left behind in India was the majority Hindu region. And of course, there were lots of other smaller minority religious groups uh, in the region as well. But those were the two dominant um, groups. Um, in 1971, the people of East Pakistan ended a several year long war for independence and won their independence and became the, uh, the land of the Bengali or Bangladesh, uh, which is still a majority Muslim country. At that time, it was the poorest country on the planet. Um, today, it is still poor, but it is no longer the poorest country in the world. Uh, it has moved about 25% up the list of poorest countries in the world and um, is now at around 140 in the world in per capita GDP, <clears throat> as opposed to the 190 that it was at when it became a country. It is very densely populated. Um, the only states in the world that are more densely populated than Bangladesh are states like Vatican City or Macau or Singapore or Hong Kong, which are small islands or very small um, states, like in the case of Vatican City and Singapore. Um, and so Bangladesh, by all intents and purposes, is the most densely populated place on earth of any place with any land. Um, there's about 200 million people in Bangladesh. Uh, the most famous person today to come out of Bangladesh, most famous living Bangladeshi is this man. His name is Muhammad Yunus. Some of you may have heard of him and read about him before. He is famous for the invention of the concept of microfinance or microcredit, which is giving small loans to individual poor people. And in his case, mostly women uh, in developing countries. He started this in Bangladesh uh, in the 1970s and in 2006 was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work for helping to lift uh, millions and millions of people around the world out of poverty um, through their own means. So a little bit about their most famous citizen today and about Bangladesh. But let's go ahead and get on to the study. Um, the case study was not incredibly long. It was only about an 11-page article. Um, but the problem it addressed was the idea of flooding on these two river systems. Um, the two rivers come together in Bangladesh after traveling through India and parts of China and Nepal. And uh, only the last, you know, say 10% of the floodplain is in Bangladesh. Um, 
but flooding is very common uh, in this area. Every four to five years, major flooding occurs. Uh, every year, flooding occurs to some degree, uh, and about 5,000 people a year in Bangladesh die from this flooding. But every four to five years, major flooding occurs, and every 20 or so years, um, flood, flooding occurs where 80% of the country is flooded as a result. So this is a very wet region of the world as opposed to the river systems that we're looking at here in Wyoming. Um, the photograph there is the most recent major flooding in, in 2010 in Bangladesh. And so the, the challenge of this is, you know, how do they predict when these floods are going to occur when over 90% of the river channel and the, um, the river system is outside of the borders of the country? Uh, China and India are both developing countries as well, although not as poor as Bangladesh. And the sharing of information is not as good as it could be between those neighboring states and the Bangladeshi government. So prediction can be very, very challenging for them. And it's they only have about a two-day lead time on flooding. The study cites other work that says that uh, an improvement in that forecast from two days to seven days could increase the ability to reduce post-flood costs, this just financial costs, from the current 3% ability to 20% uh, ability. So it has a financial incentive, and it could just save lives as well to be able to predict floods uh, much more quickly. So the, the data that's used, the remotely sensed data that is used in this study is from the Advanced Microwave Scanning radio Radiometer, uh, which is on a satellite called Aqua, and I believe it's been uh, in service since 2002, and it's pro projected to be in service into the uh, early 2020s. Um, the data that they used is publicly available from the Global Flood Detection System. These are very large pixel data sets. Um, they are kilometers in uh, to a side as opposed to, to meters or, or submeters that we've used. Um, they use uh, passive microwave radiation. There's six bands on the sensor. They use the 36.5 gigahertz um, sensor to put, to um, get what they call brightness, brightness temperature. And what they wanted to do is determine the boundary between water and land. And um, in doing so, they can develop a, um, a value of channel width uh, at various locations along the rivers. And the reason why they use this sensor is because um, this wavelength can penetrate clouds. And in very low-lying areas like in Bangladesh, which is the entire country is just above sea level, um, it's very useful when the atmosphere has to go through so much of the atmosphere. And during the monsoon season, when the majority of the water um, is um, deposited in the river system by rains, um, it's cloudy all the time. And so they needed something like this. And you can go to this um, flood detection system map, interactive map on the link below there. Um, they obtained um, SDF or satellite derived flow data at 45 locations. And you can see the different locations uh, here. And those are the points on the map on the uh, initial slide that you saw. Um, they used over 10 years. In fact, I believe it was over 12 years of data in the study. And the pixels that they look at are the pixels centered on the river, and then they calib calibrate to field measurements done on dry land nearby. And 22 of the sites are on the Ganges, and 23 are on the Brahmaputra. One thing to note is that the, the sites on the Brahmaputra go quite a bit further upstream uh, into the Himalaya than the sites on the Ganges do. And I'll come back to this a little later when we get to the conclusions. Uh, but they range from uh, 53 kilometers to 2,443 kilometers from the gauge discharge sites, which they used um, to, um, to uh, create their model. Uh, gauge discharge locations, discharge locations are inside Bangladesh. Um, these were um, observations that they got from the Flood Forecasting and Warning Center of the Bangladesh Water Development Board. One was at uh, on the Ganges at a place called Harding Bridge, Hardage Bridge, and the other is in on the Brahmaputra at a place called Bahadurabad. Hopefully, I said that right. And they're just inside the border of Bangladesh after the rivers cross in uh, from India. So one of the things they needed to do was to develop a uh, 
a relationship between the, um, the measurements that they were taking from the, um, from the satellite locations and the discharge sites inside the borders of Bangladesh. And they talk about the fact that neither river flows at the same rate and neither river flows at the same rate at the same locations. In the Tibetan highlands, uh, when the stream flow is coming out of the Himalaya and um, the elevation changes are significant, the, um, the rate of the flow waves or the celerity of the flow waves um, to the discharge site is much faster than when they get to the Ganges flood plain uh, in, in India and then especially in Bangladesh uh, because it's a much more uh, more level floodplain than further up. And so they needed to develop lag time estimates and the way they did it was um, through a regression. And they took the 45 different sites and developed a lag time based on um, the relationship between the ability to predict discharge and or the, the expected discharge rate and the actual discharge that they were able to get from that individual site. And so that's how they developed their lag time. And then they um, created these uh, measurements from the strongest correlations. And you can see three of them here in the chart uh, as they referenced in the paper. Then they also needed to consider the fact that um, there are various sources of flow. And uh, during the dry season from October to June, so right now, Stream flows are coming from the Himalaya, from the snow melt in the Himalaya, whereas in the uh, wet season from June to um, from July to September, the flow rates come from the monsoon, and it's much more significant at that point. There's much more water comes from the monsoon than comes from the, um, the snow melt. And um, one of the places in the study area is this place called Masernrim, I guess is how you say it. Uh, it is the wettest place on earth, apparently. Uh, there's a couple places in Colombia that dispute this, but uh, either way, this place gets a lot of rain. As you can see, 467 inches of rain per year. On average, um, there was, when I was reading about this, there was one year where they got a thousand inches of rain one year. So definitely a very different place than here in the Great Plains of the United States. And so they need to consider local conditions like the amount of precipitation from monsoon is um, variable and to a great degree. And so this has a great effect on the predictions. And it, even though it has uh, effect on predictions, they said it didn't have any significant effect on lag um, in this case, which I thought was interesting. So they compared the observed values uh, at the discharge stations to their predictions. And they did this in a number of different ways. They took the what they called the now cast, which was, you know, if they were right now um, saying what the rate would be based on their numbers, how accurate was their, their forecast, how good were they at predicting five days ahead, and how good were they at predicting 10 days ahead. And they found that, generally speaking, if you look at this, these lines pretty much match up for most of the year. But if you look at the one on the left, for the Ganges in 2003, and these, by the way, were, were two very wet years in the study area that they looked at. So they wanted to look at the, the rainier years for the, the study time that they were getting um, data from. And you can look at the Ganges in 2003. As soon as it starts to really rain, the narrowcast and the five-day forecast do okay, but that 10-day forecast goes in the opposite direction. So had they been doing this in 2003, in the middle of the year there, so around the 250th day, um, which I guess would be about the beginning of June, their 10-day prediction would have said that the flow, the discharge, discharge rate was actually going to go down when in fact it started going up significantly in that year. So that was a little bit troubling. Um, very similar things in the case of the, uh, sorry, Similar things in the case of the Brahmaputra, in that um, they did okay in general, but like in 2007 on the Brahmaputra, um, their prediction, especially their 10-day prediction, did not do very well at um, warning uh, of potential flooding. So the findings were that 
they miss the peaks to some degree, but they're predictive of the rise and fall during the dry season. So that's one part of this that they found was helpful. Then they ran this through what's called the Nash Sutcliffe coefficient. And to me, it just looks kind of like a, um, a sum of squares um, kind of a calculation that we do in statistics. And um, basically they're taking the prediction, predicted value um, minus the observed value, squaring it, doing that for every observation, and taking the predicted value minus the absolute value of the mean and squaring it and doing that for every, and they, they divide one by the other and then subtract that from one. And so if you had, were perfect at predicting this over the study area, you would receive a score of one, whereas if you were exactly the opposite, in every case, you'd get a score of zero. And they did this for different forecast lead times. And then this is for the entire study time period every day of the year for each river. So this doesn't take into account changes in flow during the monsoon. Um, so it's, it's a, an average of the entire time. They found that with one day lead time in both cases, they, they captured uh, about 80% of the variability in the river with one day lead time. With a two day lead time, they're very similar. And if you go out to 15 days, at 15 days, they were still capturing the majority of the variability in both river systems. And they did a little better on the Brahmaputra than they did on the Ganges um, in this case. And so if we think back to that, that seven-day lead time being perhaps a key to greatly reducing post-flood cost, um, they're somewhere around 70% uh, predictability um, based on this. Again, though, this is all year. Um, this doesn't account for the fact that during the monsoon, uh, the model doesn't work quite as well. Then they also performed another analysis called the root, the RMSE, the root mean um, square, the root mean square error uh, skill score, and this is a pretty simple um, uh, equation. Um, they took what they called persistence forecast results, and some of you may have heard of this before. I had never heard of this before, so I had to look it up. Um, persistent forecast apparently is where you you predict. You assume that con your conditions at the time of the forecast are not going to change. But right now, it's about 9 o'clock. I'm in Windsor, Colorado. It's about 40 degrees out right now. The sun is shining. And so if I were making a persistence forecast, I would say that the day that I'm forecasting here in Windsor, it's going to be at 9 o'clock. It's going to be 40 degrees and sunny again. So tomorrow would be like that. Obviously, tomorrow, that, that forecast is going to probably be better most of the time than 15 days from now. So your persistence forecast should not be very good 15 days from now, unless say you're in Hawaii where you can predict the same thing over and over again pretty confidently. So they compared their forecast to that persistence forecast. And a score of zero would mean that you were no better. They found that they were again, better on the Brahmaputra than at the Ganges, than on the Ganges at predicting discharge rates, as opposed to just keeping the discharge rate the same in the predicted day as opposed to it is now. And 15 days out, they got a lot better. So there is, in a sense, some value in this based on these two scores. Their conclusions from this were that um, it is useful. This There is hope that this passive microwave remote sensing can be useful for these two river systems, that they improved over the persistence method of forecasting on both rivers for all lead times from zero to 15 days, but the accuracy on the Brahmaputra improved more. And going back to that map, if you look at that on slide one, you'll notice that the, um, the points where they, they measured channel width uh, on the Brahmaputra are much further up, at least over half of the points are much further upstream of the discharge site than those on the Ganges because the Brahmaputra is longer. Uh, so a lot of those locations are really high up in the Tibetan highlands. Um, and so, you know, my thinking is they just are, they're capturing more of, of the channel with their predictions. But anyway, they didn't really address that in, uh, in their case study. 
They said that this method is best suited for river systems that are not confined. So I would guess that means large river systems on giant floodplains like these where the channel can change quite a bit from day to day and from year to year that, that this is a good, um, good prediction method for those as opposed to may, maybe river systems in Europe where those, those channels are more confined or not likely to burst out of their banks because of even artificial um, uh, methods to hold the channel together. And then finally, that this method allows, one of the, the main advantages, and I think the reason why they, they looked into doing this from the beginning is that this method allows for daily collection. Um, during the monsoon, uh, it's cloudy every day, and you have to have something that penetrates that cloud cover, and this particular band, um, is useful in doing that, and it, so it makes it superior to other methods. And I think that for me, looking at this, that's the most meaningful part because we're talking about uh, saving lives and helping people that are among the poorest on Earth. And so this is a, a slightly different application of remote sensing than what we've been looking at in that this one uh, is really geared at social, cultural uh, types of benefits. Uh, almost exclusively, at least in what they were writing about. And so I found it interesting, and hopefully you did as well, and I hope you enjoyed it. And have a great day.